This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Africa Center for Disease Control says it is prepared for Ebola response in the DRC and calls on AU members' states to do all they can. The continent's most awaited soccer finale on in about two hours as Senegal and Algeria face off in the Africa Cup of Nations final. And South Africa's army joins police in Cape Town to clamp down on gangsters. Hello and welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us. I'm Richard Sorolenta, live in Nairobi. And for those of you joining us from across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for joining us. And tonight, I'm alongside Uche Okoronkwa, who has our business headlines. Uche. Thanks, Richard. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Biz. Egypt rakes in $83 million, hosting the Africa Cup of Nations before tonight's final. And Barrick Gold Corporation to take full control of Acacia Mining after raising its bid. Of course, all that coming up within the program for now. Back to you, Richard. Thank you, Uche. As the world commemorates 50 years since man's first landing on the moon, China's own space pursuits notch another milestone. The nation's manned space engineering office says the Tiangong-2 space laboratory was controlled off orbit and re-entered the atmosphere at 2106 Beijing time on July the 19th. A small amount of debris was reported to have fallen into the intended safe waters in the South Pacific, but experts say it was a largely successful undertaking. Here is CGTN's Ning Hong with more. <laughs> Tengumtu's controlled re-entry into the atmosphere marks the successful completion of all tasks in the space laboratory phase of China's manned space engineering. Tiangong-2 is in good condition, but the equipment board on the space lab was manufactured in the time of Tiangong-1 and they are approaching the end of their lifespan. As a responsible country, we need to make sure it can safely re-enter the atmosphere. That's why we made the decision. The re-entry process is divided into two phases. First, the Tiangong-2 lowered its orbit to an elliptical orbit with the perigee of 190 kilometers on July 18th. And in the second phase, it lowered its orbit to 70 kilometers and entered the atmosphere. We have mobilized all the space-based and ground-based measurement and control resources and the relay satellites to ensure Tiangong-2's re-entry process has a comprehensive and reliable measurement and control support. Since Tiangong-2's space lab was launched into orbit on September 15, 2016, it has completed four rendezvous with the Shenzhou-11 manned spacecraft and a Tianzhou-1 cargo spacecraft. It has also successfully supported two astronauts in orbit for 30 days. The medium-term stay for astronauts in Tiangong-2 has laid a solid foundation for our long-term residence of space station missions in the future. The success of the mission marks the end of the second phase of China's manned space mission, and now China's entering the third phase building its own space station, the Tiangong. China's manned space station is now under construction. With the name of Tiangong, it is designed to serve for over 10 years in space. Ning Hong, CGTN, Beijing. On to the latest on the Ebola situation in the Great Lakes region. The World Health Organization is now denying reports that the female fishmonger who died of Ebola recently could have traveled to Rwanda while sick. While addressing journalists in Geneva, the WHO spokesperson, Margaret Harris, said although the woman could have traveled to Rwanda before, there is no confirmation that she traveled there while displaying symptoms of the disease. However, she says the 22-year-old fishmonger did visit Uganda and Goma. At the same time, the WHO has withdrawn the report from a website where it was first published. The website where daily updates on Ebola in the DRC were being posted has also been shut down. 
The WHO says some of the reports posted on the site were not verified. Rwanda has never had any confirmed cases of Ebola since it was first reported in the Eastern DRC 11 months ago. We are absolutely certain because what happened was our team in Beni, based in Beni, went across and talked to everybody and tracked it day by day. Now, in her life, she may have gone to Rwanda. Everybody there work is incredibly mobile, especially when it comes to trading. People are traders, they go all over the place. But the important thing is she did not spend any time in Rwanda while symptomatic. And as you know, Ebola is not transmitted until you are symptomatic. Meanwhile, the African Union's African Center for Disease Control, or Africa CDC, now says it is prepared and equipped to deal with an Ebola outbreak on the continent. Africa CDC Director Dr. John Ken Gassong said unlike in the 2015 outbreak in West Africa, the CDC has invested in better mechanisms to contain any Ebola situation. By declaring this a public health emergency of international concern, we want to be sure that the international community and member states in Africa do not impose any restrictions on travels to anyone going into or coming outside of the Democratic Republic of Congo. That would be contrary to in the, the international uh, health regulations of 2005, which is a legal binding document that all WHO member states sign on to. Rather, by doing such actions, it would impede our ability to effectively control the virus. Well, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and Regional Director for Africa is also warning against closing of borders by countries neighboring the DRC as the Ebola situation takes a new turn. Raouf Mazou says restricting movement of people will only make it hard to monitor the scale of the spread of Ebola since people will still use illegal border crossings. No, of course, everybody is concerned because uh, uh, the spread of Ebola uh, is something that uh, could have a devastating impact on the, on the continent. Uh, you have, uh, what, 2,400 cases, about 1,500 people uh, died. Um, and uh, we have many, many refugees who are, have been moving around the, the, the region. Uh, and it's that movement of people that can actually contribute to the, to the spread of the, of the illness if it is not, of the disease if it is not properly, properly managed. But the positive thing in that is that there are very strong contingency plans uh, to UNHCR involving UNHCR governments to make sure that at no point government decide to block and close the borders because that's the problem. Start closing the borders, then you end up having people crossing through uh, irregular uh, border crossing points. And on a lighter note, we are now just under two hours away from the finals of the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations as Senegal takes on Algeria at the Cairo International Stadium. And in Senegal, Dakar, there are high expectations as the team seeks their first Cup of Nations title. CGTN's Mohamed Aboubakar has more. Since the Africa Cup of Nations kicked off in Egypt, the Senegalese fan club Ale Kassa have set up festive atmosphere in the capital, Dakar. As the lands of Teranga prepare for their final clash against Algeria in the finals of the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations, the renowned fan club pledged to set up in every corner of Dakar City, dancing and singing with fans before the beginning of the final. In the streets and markets of Dakar, fans have already started buying all kinds of accessories to cheer their national team. We are well prepared for this final and we're looking forward to it with great enthusiasm. I came to the market this morning to buy accessories such as the flag. There are plenty of other people who also bought armbands and jerseys just for this final and we're sure that Senegal will win the AFCON this year. For the moment, we have nothing else to say about the team. Other than that, we are very confident. The Lions have reached the final. 
They have to win this game and bring this cup back to the country. The whole of Senegal need it and we are behind the team. If Senegal does not win this 2019 AFCON, I can say that the national team should no longer participate in the competition. Now is the time to bring the cup back to the Senegalese people. Senegal enjoys the status of favorites, so it is well on its way to winning it. And I'm 100% sure the Lions will win. This will be the Taranga Lions' only second appearance in an African Cup of Nations final after they lost to Cameroon on penalties 17 years ago in Mali. Senegal fans across the continent will be hoping that their team can finally be crowned the champions of Africa after Friday night's final. Mohamed Abubakar, CGTN. Meanwhile, for supporters of the Desert Foxes back home, the final has presented the opportunity to showcase their backing of the side and specifically of head coach Jamel Belmadi. A young artist from the town of Mozuna in the country's west have painted a mural of the Algerian tactician in recognition of his efforts in guiding the team to their first finals in 29 years, can you believe it? The one-day project allows the graffiti artist to cheer on the North African side who beat Nigeria 2-1 to one in the semifinals to reach Friday's finals. The young artists say they hope the team wins the continental title and bring home the trophy. We love the Algerian national football team very much and we wish to win against Senegal on Friday. And this graffiti which we have done represents our gratitude for what this wonderful team has done. I expect and hope to win the Africa Cup of Nations. We are stronger and the result will be 3-0 for Algeria, hopefully. Winning and nothing but winning the final. We are the strongest and we will get the African Cup. All right, let's get more now on the venue of the finals. Our very own CGTN Sadiq Shaban, who is right in the middle of it all, joins us live from Cairo. Sadiq, great to see you. Give us a feel of the atmosphere in and around the Cairo International Stadium ahead of the finals. Sadiq. Well, Richard, the mood here is ecstatic. Just behind me, uh, the fans are in the stadium. We've, we, in, in, our, in our very uh, conservative estimates, we've counted about 5,000 Algerian fans so far, uh, most of whom have traveled here overnight. Uh, would you believe it, from Algiers for this final. As you mentioned, it's the first time that Algeria is in the final for the first time since 1990. So it's a lifetime uh, of, of a final, if you will, uh, for the players and also for the fans. We still have uh, some fans uh, are still out there, you know, outside the stadium, still uh, trying to get in because uh, security here is very tight. And it takes hours uh, for security personnel to clear the fans to come in and just make sure that everything is fine. So uh, we, we're actually in, right in the middle of it. And I can tell you, we can feel the pulse, uh, the heartbeat of the final, uh, you know, is on. And it's just a matter of minutes uh, before the teams come here. Now, we've just seen off the shot of a camera, uh, the Senegal team has just arrived here to feel, uh, to have a warm up of the pitch. Uh, we do expect Algeria in the next 10 minutes to also be bust in and just have a sense of the pitch uh, before the closing ceremony begins and uh, shortly after the big party that is the final of the Africa Cup of Nations. All right, Sadiq, we, we can certainly feel your excitement, but let me ask you this. Senegal and Algeria have reached the finals for the first time in 17 and 29 years, respectively. What would victory tonight mean for each of these two teams? It would be such a big deal if Senegal wins the Africa Cup of Nations this year. Senegal is the best ranked team in Africa at the moment and in the FIFA rankings. Uh, they are in this final the last time 17 years ago. They are depending on mostly, you know, talent and uh, star players like Sadio Mane for this tournament. And they are saying they have never won this tournament despite very impressive accolades of those players and the team over the years. They've come short over the years and this is their finest hour in 17 years. So coming through to the final and winning it will be their very first 
On the other hand, Algeria say they did not come here to make numbers and they have proven it uh, through the group stages in the semi-finals and now in the final. It will be a generational success, if you will, Richard, if Algeria wins this. Uh, uh, their star striker, uh, Mahrez, was not born by the time they won uh, their last title in 1990. So it will really be a big deal, particularly for Algeria, who didn't qualify uh, for the last World Cup in Russia. All right, Sadiq, my final question to you before we let you go. You've been watching... Uh, these two teams for the past couple of weeks, and we do envy you. Who do you think will win this match and why? Uh, Richard, I don't think I'm the right person to tell you uh, whether Algeria will win it or whether Senegal will win it. But let me give you a, uh, just a quick sense of who might, uh, you know, take the final uh, this evening. Look, uh, these two teams met, have met before at the group stage and Algeria beat Senegal by a solitary goal. So if that is any consideration, so you know who already has a foot into the, into the, in, into the big celebrations tonight. Now, uh, Algeria has been the most... Uh, uh, technically clinical side in this tournament. They have never lost a match here. They have won four. They have only uh, drawn once and scored ten goals. Uh, that doesn't compare very well with Senegal who have lost and drew matches uh, you know, as, as the tournament progresses. So in terms of head-to-head -head and the tail of the taper, uh, it's very clear uh, which side is favoured to win the trophy tonight. All right, Shadiq Shaban, thank you for your insights. Thank you for bringing us that story. Uh, we shall be following the finals closely. That's Shadiq Shaban talking to us from Cairo. Moving on now to South Africa, where the Army is now active in Cape Town's most gang-infested areas in a bid to root out gangsters and drug peddlers. The move comes after President Cyril Ramaphosa gave the green light to send in the National Defense Force troops. CGTN's Travis Andrews has more. It's been a week since President Ramaphosa approved the deployment of armed forces to the Cape's crime hotspots. And now they are finally boots on the ground. Some community members believe their prayers have been answered, with the army playing a vital force multiplying role in assisting police to crack down on violent crimes. We want the army to protect us because here it's like... I can't tell you how many people has died here already. I think it's over 60 people already in Blackie Stop that has been passed on. And through gangsterism and through violence and through um, lots of other issues. They've been deployed to 10 areas identified with the worst crime levels in the city, including Blackie Stop, which is considered as a war zone under the grip of gangsters. Juliette Adamus is one person who has felt the wrath that violence and unemployment can have on her family firsthand after a 21 year old son was gunned down in a suspected gang hit. He was a gangster, he was selling um, drugs for the gangsters, and that he, then he sold him. Sold him there at the back, and when I come in there, he's laying there with the, the bullets in his stomach. For well, it's little consolation to see troops rolling in, but for others, it isn't. They're just glad to see the long arm of the law working to prevent further violence. It was just a few days ago that gang violence claimed its latest victim on these streets. And even though the army is here, there are still underlying social issues at play. Unemployment levels are high, which has left many turning to a life of crime and drugs. And that has had an adverse effect on many families. Frustrated and that's why they do the things that they do. They, they go to the road and go rob the people. That's what they do. The ladies, they scuttle around to, to give food to their children uh, with their husbands. For now, though, troops and the police will continue conducting search and seizure operations, while all three spheres of government work on a more holistic long-term plan that will bring much-needed relief to many years. Travis Andrews, CGTN, Cape Town. You're watching Africa Live on CGT, and we have a lot more stories coming your way, including. United Nations explains its ambitious plan to tackle xenophobia and hate speech. And relief agencies in Uganda launch appeal for funds to help sustain 1.3 million refugees. Africa, the most iconic wildlife destination in the world. Its unique ecosystems were formed over countless eons. Many people can only dream of visiting this natural paradise. But 
now, for the first time ever, CGTN Wild Wonderland Live Show is bringing Africa to you through all of our online platforms. 14 episodes from July 22nd to 28th take you to adventure through the Great Plains of Kenya's Masai Mara, the Serengeti in Tanzania, and the Greater Kruger Park in South Africa. Welcome aboard the wildest ride of a lifetime. This is Wild Wonderland Live Show, only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back now to China, U.S. trade talks. Beijing says top negotiators from both sides have talked over the phone. They've discussed the next steps following talks between Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Donald Trump last month in Osaka. China is urging the U.S. to show resolve towards reaching a trade deal. There's a Chinese saying that goes, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. It applies to this situation. China and the U.S. are taking the right direction to resolve friction through negotiations, but it is certainly not a simple process. Otherwise, we would not have had 11 rounds of talks. But we must stick to this direction and strive for beneficial results on the basis of mutual respect and equality. A ship carrying a group of 10 Turkish sailors kidnapped from a vessel by pirates off the coast of Nigeria is now reported to be in Ghana. Nigerian authorities say rescue efforts are ongoing. From the capital of Abuja, correspondent Phil Ihaza reports. The incident was reported 18 hours after the vessel was attacked. That's according to the Nigerian Navy Director of Information, Commodore Suleiman Dahoun, who also said the current whereabouts of the abducted sailors was unknown. It's understood the vessel was intercepted by a Ghanaian Navy ship and escorted to Tema port in Ghana. Commodore Dahoun said naval units have been deployed to help rescue the 10 abducted Turkish sailors and ongoing efforts to find the pirates' hideout. The ship was sailing from Cameroon to Ivory Coast when it was intercepted by at least 12 heavily armed pirates of the coast of Nigeria. The maritime company operations manager Numan Pascoy said out of 18 sailors on board, 10 of them were abducted from the ship while the others were left to sail the vessel to Ghana. The attackers damaged the vessel's navigational equipment before leaving with their hostages. The Gulf of Guinea, where the incident took place, borders countries such as Nigeria, Ghana, Benin, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea and Togo. It's rated by the International Maritime Bureau as the most dangerous sea in the world for piracy. At least 21 incidents have been recorded around Nigeria so far this year compared to 31 in the same period of 2018. Phil Ihaza, CGTN Abuja, Nigeria. Meanwhile, alarmed by increasing xenophobia and hate speech around the world, the United Nations has launched an ambitious plan to tackle the vice head on. And the man leading the fight is Adama Dieng, the UN Secretary General's Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. Our UN correspondent Liling Tang sits down with Mr. Dieng, who explains why it's important to take action now. The past year has seen deadly, hate-inspired attacks around the world. From the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, to the mosque attacks in New Zealand, to the Easter Sunday bombings in Sri Lanka. The United Nations says enough is enough. We are witnessing today a rise of uh, anti-Semitism, racism. We are seeing uh, refugees, migrants being vilified and humiliated. When we see today the rise of uh, neo-Nazi groups, when we see extreme right-wing groups in many parts of the world, and particularly in the Western world, we, with uh, the gas chambers. It did not start with the bombs. It started with words. The genocide in Rwanda did not start with the machetes. It started long before, at a time when the Tutsis were being named cockroaches, were being named after animals' names. So therefore, we have to realize that hate speech can lead to hate crimes, hate speech can lead to genocide, to crimes against humanity, etc. To what extent do you think the rhetoric that we're hearing now out of the White House and elsewhere within the U.S. 
falls under the definition of hate speech, under the UN definition of hate speech. There is no international legal definition of hate speech. But we all understand clearly uh, what we mean by hate speech. Although uh, the characterization of what is hateful is controversial, it is disputed, but at the United Nations, we do understand by hate speech uh, the, uh, any kind of communication in speech, in writing, in behavior uh, that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group on the basis of uh, uh, its uh, race, nationality, gender, uh, descent. Others who are uh, targeted because of their religion or because of their ethnicity. Here in the United States, critics are accusing President Donald Trump of racism for inciting hate through his handling of the border crisis and for his attacks on minority congresswomen, including Somalia-born American Ilan Omar. What do you make of U.S. President Donald Trump's comments recently to the Congresswomen, the four minority Congresswomen, telling them to go back to their home countries when they're Americans? What do you make of that kind of talk? Well, I would simply say that diversity is a richness. Diversity is not a threat. And the United States, if it is today one of the most powerful country, it is thanks to the diversity in this country. This is the country of migrant. Where do you draw the line, though, between condemning hate speech and protecting freedom of speech? Where do you draw the line? Addressing hate speech uh, does not mean limiting or prohibiting uh, freedom of, of speech. It means keeping hate speech from escalating uh, into more something more dangerous. Uh, particularly incitement to, to discrimination, to uh, violence, uh, and, or incitement to genocide, which is prohibited under international law. To tackle this, the UN is harnessing the power of its key agencies and global partners to monitor and analyze hate speech as well as address its root causes. But perhaps one of the most ambitious goals under its action plan is to prevent and combat the spread of hate speech on social media. Li Lingtan, CGTN at the United Nations in New York. Relief agencies in Uganda are calling for urgent contributions to aid the humanitarian response to refugees. Hundreds of thousands of new arrivals continue to enter the country. Uganda is currently home to more than 1.3 million refugees who are in dire need of humanitarian assistance. CGTN's Daniel Arab Moy reports. The humanitarian response to refugees in Uganda is severely underfunded, putting a strain on the already dire situation. Inadequate food supply, water shortage and poor sanitation has hit refugee sites across the country, leaving many struggling to survive. Since we arrived here, food has been a challenge. What we are given is not enough to cater for our families and the water here is not safe for drinking. We kindly request for more support and improvement in the quality of the rations given to us because we are not getting enough. Even sugar is in short supply. The refugee appeal comes at a time when Uganda and partners are witnessing a critical funding shortage for the refugee response in the country. Currently, UNHCR is facing enormous challenges in stabilizing existing services in the settlements due to daily influx from the Democratic Republic of Congo. The ability to invest in a timely manner in long-term and more sustainable interventions for refugees in Uganda is being severely compromised due to underfunding. Officials say that humanitarian funding needs to increase and must be sustained as long as refugees from South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo continue to flee to Uganda. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN, Hoima, Uganda. You are watching Africa Live on CGTN. Time now for our business headlines with Uche.
Thanks, Richard. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. Egypt rakes in $83 million hosting the Africa Cup of Nations before tonight's final. And Barrick Gold Corporation to take full control of Acacia Mining after raising its bid. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Well, let's start off in Egypt. The country's revenue from hosting the ongoing 2019 Africa Cup of Nations has so far reached about $83 million. Now, that's according to the president of the Confederation of African Football. Ahmed Ahmed says this year's tournament has exceeded both the 2015 edition in South Africa and the one in Gabon in 2017. Now, despite being troubled by chaos from behind the scenes as well as uh, baking heat, uh, this year's event has managed to serve up some entertainment and drama uh, in its expanded 24-team group stage. Now, Senegal and Algeria are scheduled to secure a place in the tournament's history as they battle for the cup in the finals this Friday in Cairo. C'est pour ça qu'on dit toujours le football africain est sous-évalué. That is why we say that African soccer is underestimated. Today, we can say that we can go further. There has been a lot of improvement compared to the previous Africa Cup of Nations, including 2013. The turnover in South Africa was about $49 million in 2015, $52 million in 2017 in Gabon, and now $83 million here in Egypt. Let's head to Tanzania now, where Barrick Gold has agreed to buy the roughly 36% stake in Acacia Mining, which it didn't already own. Now, the latest deal ends a two-month standoff between the world's second biggest gold miner and its Africa unit. Now, this comes hours before a regulatory deadline for Barrick to make a firm bid. The company sweetened its offer to win over Acacia shareholders, some of whom had decried the previous bid was too low. The new offer values Acacia at $1.2 billion, a 53.5% premium to Acacia's share price at the time of Barrick's indicative offer in May, as well as a 24.3% premium to Acacia's closing price on Thursday. Now, the agreement is expected to pave the way for the Canadian firm to resolve its ongoing public battle with Tanzania's government. And moving on, the decision by South Africa's Reserve Bank to cut its repo rate by 25 basis points has been broadly welcomed in the country. On Thursday, we saw the bank cut its benchmark lending rate for the first time since last March to 6.5%. The move is aimed at stimulating more growth in the stagnating South African economy. Here's CGTN Sumitra Naidu with the details. It's a good thing because much more people that actually need help financially can actually apply for loans and don't have to pay more. Hopefully it will empower our people financially, so it's a good thing. It's a very positive uh, change. It's been a while since it's been lowered. Amazing, you know, everything is so tight. Petrol price, price of food, etc. So at least we get some relief with the bond rates. The commercial banks have already reduced the prime lending rate to 10%. For those paying off credit cards, home loans and other debt, the reduced interest rate will provide some relief. But economists are cautioning that there's still some tough times ahead. 
So we found that housing prices have also been quite depressed in the last couple of years. Real growth in the housing market has actually been negative for some time. And this has been on the back of the consumer remaining depressed and the willingness to purchase new properties remaining quite depressed. So going forward, while this will help home loans picking up, we do need to see a resumption in economic growth and a resumption in consumer sentiment in order to see the purchase of bigger durable good items like homes. The Reserve Bank lowered its growth forecast for 2019 down to a mere 0.6% with a warning that monetary policy is not the answer to reviving this weak economy. We do need to see some structural reforms or micro reforms in order to kickstart growth. Now you do get some of the shorter term reforms that we can do and these are the so-called low hanging fruits. So for example, we can reduce port tariffs, we can make it easier for tourists to come into the country and then we have the longer standing reforms fixing ESCOM, the other state owned enterprises, making sure that they are on firm financial footing. The RAND rallied soon after the Reserve Bank announced the rate cut, suggesting more relief could be in the offing, especially if the U.S. Federal Reserve cuts its own borrowing rates aggressively next week. There are still concerns, though, over the U.S.-China trade spat, rising tensions in the Middle East and Brexit that could cause volatility in the RAND again, and that won't be good for inflation. Samita Ranalu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. And in Zimbabwe, public sector workers say they have accepted a government pay offer, averting a potentially damaging strike in the country. Now, this follows a meeting on Thursday between the government and the Apex Council to improve the welfare state of government workers. A statement from the union indicates that the government agreed to pay each and every civil servant the sum of about 400 Zimbabwe dollars, just about 45 US dollars, as a once-off payment, together with the July salary regardless of one's grade. Now the workers had on Tuesday threatened to stay away from work unless the state raised their wages to the equivalent of 475 US dollars per month for the lowest paid staff. The union said it will continue talks with the government on another wage increase which will take effect in August. An American credit rating agency, Moody, says Congo's recently agreed upon a $450 million IMF support program is a positive step for the country. The financial services company currently rates the OPEC member at CAA2, that is equivalent to the lower end of the junk grade bracket, and is just above the level where a default is seen as imminent. Now, last week, the International Monetary Fund finalized a three-year program with Congo. This followed an agreement struck by the government in April to restructure some two billion US dollars in debt to China. By 2017, following the oil crash, Congo's debt levels had ballooned to 118% of GDP, landing the Central African nation into a financial crisis. Meanwhile, projections show that by 2021, there will be nearly 25 million online shoppers in South Africa. And it is expected they'll spend in the region of 190 US dollars each by 2023. Now, currently, these shoppers are spending about $95 each in the electronics and media sectors. Here's Angelo Coppola with a look at what's happening in the rest of Africa. South African online shopping growth has increased annually at 20%, but the retail component of that is still only 1.4%. In the rest of Africa, it's far lower than that. The only real hotspots are Egypt, Nigeria and Kenya. Kenya probably the most sophisticated in terms of platforms and also the integration of M-Pesa for mobile payments has been a big boost in Kenya. Nigeria probably has the uh, biggest online retail operation in terms of its potential, which is Jumia, and uh, that has in fact been listed on uh, one of the US uh, stock exchanges. The opportunities for growth in online retail shopping are confined to specific areas. Cities like Lagos and Nairobi are definitely ready for online shopping. They have extensive online retail services available uh, in those markets. And that is because the infrastructure is there, the communications is there, banks are there as well. Although online retail is supposed to be digital, it is very much facilitated by the existence of physical infrastructure like uh, transport networks, the uh, roads, delivery services and banking services. 
Looking at the South African online shopping market, data is fairly accurate. Similar information isn't available continentally, however. At this stage, we can't really see the percentage of impact that online retail is making outside of South Africa. In South Africa, we have an exact number. Worldwide Works conducted research that showed that 1.4% of total retail in South Africa is conducted online. The total retail market in South Africa is just over 1 trillion rand and online retail makes up about 14 billion rand of that. The retail shopping environment is different in each of the continent's countries. The difference between South Africa and other markets across Africa is that there's a very powerful mall culture of people going to shopping malls to do their shopping. And that is what's keeping online uh, retail from making a bigger impact on this economy. In other African markets, however, you don't have that extensive mall culture or a mall infrastructure. The growth of retail online shopping is patchy at the best of times on the continent and largely depends on sufficient infrastructure and access to payment options. And of course the most important, disposable income. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Well that's all for now in Africa Live Biz, but coming up on Global Business Africa, South Africa's former president Jacob Zuma continues to give evidence at the corruption inquiry and that's after threatening to withdraw from the process earlier. Of course we'll bring you more on that top of the hour for now. Back to you Richard. Thank you so much Uche. This is Africa Live on CGT and we have a lot more amazing, wonderful and inspiring stories coming your way. Here's a look at what's ahead. Conservationists fight to save the endangered African grey parrot in Cameroon. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. Nigeria is my home. 160 million vibrant, ambitious individuals constantly seeking the perfect self-expression. It is these people who inspired me to be that person that is seen, to be a voice that is heard, and ultimately to be the anchor that I am. I have to tap in, tune in, and turn on the very best qualities within me to deliver the news. I'm Richard Nta, an anchor for CGTN. Welcome back. A conservation park in Cameroon is trying to preserve the African gray parrot, which are now on the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Endangered Species list due to illicit trade and habitat loss. According to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, the parrot is the single most heavily traded wild bird. CGTN's Brian Toussaint tells us more. Due to its ability to perfectly mimic noises, including human speech, the African gray parrot is one of the most sought-after parrots worldwide. The Limbe Wildlife Center receives about 5 to 25 parrots every month that are brought to the center from all over Cameroon. The majority of the parrots arrived here are dehydrated, ridden with parasites, and injured with their feathers cut by poachers to prevent them from flying. They are then treated and kept until they are strong enough to be released into the wild. So we rescue, we rehabilitate, and then we release. Like these parrots uh, that are rescued, we are rehabilitating them for release. So doing a giant hair check, pulling, pulling, pulling off the clipped feathers, uh, pulling off feathers that are destroyed by glue, is to stimulate fast growth of new feathers that can enable them to fly. Deforestation, poor regulation of trade, and increased trafficking for the pet industry have led to the decline of the African gray parrot. An African gray can fetch thousands of US dollars on the international market. So this other set of parrots we're working in with are kind of domesticated. And they have been trained to call the other wild parrots. When the wild parrots come, they catch them. And then they are able to traffic them to Nigeria and then sell them there. Um, it is quite a good market in Nigeria. There's, it's quite loose, so you can get in Nigeria and sell them. But in Cameroon, it's not possible for them. So they use the Atlantic Ocean 
This part of the record from Kripi, the Libyan Atlantic Ocean, get into Nigeria and they sell them. In 2016, the highly coveted parrot species was placed on the UN's Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species Appendix 1, which prohibits any cross-border movement in the birds or their body parts for commercial sale. But this has not deterred poachers from hunting the birds. The center, however, has been raising awareness among the local population on the advantages of conservation, encouraging people to donate parrots to the center instead of keeping them as pets. And despite lacking adequate funds, the staff here hopes the facility will soon expand to accommodate more parrots. Brian Tusat, CGTN. Staying in South Africa, Johannesburg College celebrated the Nelson Mandela Day by making sleeping bags from newspapers for the homeless. CGTN's Yulisa and Jamela has more. The Nelson Mandela Foundation asserts that the late former president Nelson Mandela made an imprint on the world for 67 years. Beginning in 1942, when he started campaigning for the human rights of every South African, his life has been an inspiration to the world. So, by dedicating 67 minutes of your time, one of every year of Mandela's service, you'll be giving back and contributing to global humanitarianism. Here at Kingsmead College in Johannesburg, pupils used their 67 minutes of Mandela Day to make sleeping bags from recycled plastics and homemade scarves. The blankets will then be distributed to homeless people. It is apparently very warm. So it's been tried and tested. Um, and it's amazing because it doesn't cost a lot. And as I said, it lasts an entire season. We also put a scarf. Um, made by the senior school girls inside the sleeping bag so that that's an extra gift they receive when they open the sleeping bag. It's also about ensuring that young people understand the need to share with others from an early age. We really encourage the girls to do community service. We try to encourage them through various activities to be aware of what is going on um, in the world out there and how we can get involved to actually make a difference. We're making it out of newspaper and plastic. The newspaper is to keep them warm and the plastic so it doesn't get all wet and soggy. I think that it's important to do service and give back to people who are less privileged than us. I feel like the poor would like a warmer place to sleep um, at night because it's very cold at night time. Giving to our um, country is very important, you know, especially in this day and age where people are so less um, privileged than us. We celebrate the day of Mandela's birthday by making sleeping bags for the poor people. There is no national consensus on homeless people in South Africa. In fact, many researchers depend on individual studies on homelessness and homeless people in each city. And those studies estimate that there are about 200,000 people who are homeless in South Africa. Members of the street community come from a variety of backgrounds. They're forced to live in these circumstances for varying reasons. In winter months like now, life in the streets can be quite unbearable. So these sleeping bags will go a long way in keeping them warm. You listen to Jamela for City to in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we are not done just yet. We've got your sports news coming up after the break. Here's a sneak peek at the headline. European champions Liverpool step up their preseason in the U.S. as they prepare to face German side Dortmund. Africa, where champions are made, 